Welcome to how to build a Blackgate Sweet Pea 5 inch gauge locomotive. This is part 1, the introduction and overview of the method and reason for building this miniature steam locomotive. Some viewers may be wondering why there is one already sat on my table. The answer is, my friend James Evans, who's just turned 17 years of age, wants a miniature steam locomotive and this seems like a good way of getting him one. I bought one that was part finished to quite a good standard, not perfect, but quite good. And I'm going to completely dismantle this and start again. Well, that is, except for the frames, which only really need repainting. Everything else needs some attention. The reason for doing it this way is just speed. Early next week, I'm going to go over to Blackgate's Engineering and pick up a kit of parts for this engine. And that way, I'll be able to show you how simple or difficult it is to make one of these. This engine is very much unfinished. I don't know where it came from, possibly from someone's shed. There are quite a few parts missing, and some parts, as you will see in future episodes, are quite rusty. As I've just mentioned, I'm doing it this way to speed up the build. There are many laser-cut parts available for this model from Blackgate's Engineering. And that in itself would actually speed up the build, but it would be nowhere near as quick as doing it the way I'm doing it. A word of caution though, whenever you buy a part-finished miniature steam locomotive, be very, very careful. First of all, ask yourself, why is this locomotive part-finished? There are various reasons that could apply. Did the builder pass away, or did he just give it up as a bad job? I think I'll start by explaining one or two things about this locomotive. It is a narrow gauge locomotive, and that's why it's so much bigger than a standard gauge locomotive. And the good thing about this particular Sweet Pea is it's the 042 version. What does that mean? Wheel sets on steam locomotives are described by three numbers, the first one being wheels in front of the driving wheels, the second number is the number of driving wheels, and the third number is the number of trailing wheels. This engine is better known as an 042 locomotive. No wheels at the front, four in the middle and two at the back. Why do you need more wheels on a steam locomotive other than the ones that drive it on the track? The front wheels guide the main wheels as it goes down the track and help to carry some of the weight. And in this case, the rear wheels also carry some of the weight but prevent you pressing down on the back of the locomotive which would lift the front wheels off the track. And also they just stop it wobbling about on the track. I know that's a simple explanation, but this video is about building a miniature locomotive and it's not really about full-size steam locomotive axle loading. So I'll leave it there and remove the saddle tank. This saddle tank's very well made. I think the removable central panel does need more bolts in it. This style of saddle tank, as opposed to the one that goes all the way round, gives the engine a different kind of style, and actually I prefer this type. In this clip my friend James is showing the aluminium casting that will be machined to make the cap for the tank. For now though, everything's going to go under the table, one bit at a time. I don't normally move work into the kitchen, but I have run out of space until the large 7.25 inch gauge engine is picked up on the 3rd of February. It's just one of the benefits of living by yourself. I can do this without causing an argument with anyone. The boiler you see is a bit odd. This is not the original boiler that was designed to go with the engine that's been built. The boiler has some problems, which I hope I can sort out. If I can't, it will go in the scrap bin. Someone has fitted more boiler bushes into the barrel for the check valves. There are four of them in total, but the problem with the boiler is not the check valve bushes. The man from whom I bought this explained that there was some weeping at the tube plate end on a couple of the tubes, and because of this it failed the hydraulic test. What I'm going to do is plug up all the holes and retest it and see where the leaks are coming from. If they come from the smoke box end, I can deal with it. 
In this clip, James is lifting the boiler into a position where you can see the front tube plate. And if you look carefully, you can see a little bit of discoloration around the top two or three tubes. The first thing I'm going to do is drop this into my acid bath to clean it. That will actually clean the boiler inside and out, but the part that I'm interested in cleaning is the tube plate. I need to re-silver solder this. Something I noticed about this boiler that is unusual is that it has two superheater flues. Here my friend James is pointing this out, two larger flues at either side. Which means that two superheaters can run down these flues to reheat the steam as it comes from the wet header. And the wet header is the pipe from the regulator to the cylinders. In this clip you can see it clearly it's the bush with four studs in it. This boiler also has a hollow stay and that's for the steam blower. My only mild worry is that maybe it's also leaking from the tubes inside the firebox and this is more difficult. If I stick a blowtorch into the firebox it will just go out. And currently I do not have oxypropane or oxyacetylene available. If this boiler is no good, it's no big deal. Because the cost of the boiler in with the price of the rest of the engine's parts wasn't much. Here is a smoke box and this does not fit on the boiler, which tells me that this boiler was never designed for this engine, although the boiler mountings do fit on the chassis. This is not a problem, the chimney is removable, and once that's out of the way I can fit the entire smoke box in my smart and brown lathe and slightly enlarge the area where the boiler fits. A smoke box is a very important part of a miniature steam locomotive, the smoke box door needs to be really tight against the smoke box to stop any air leaks. Any air leaks would destroy the vacuum and the engine would not steam properly. There's a special bar across the middle of the smoke box, but on this one it's a bit tight. It should be very easy to remove. On the smoke box door is a specially shaped fitting that goes into this crossbar. Then you rotate it and then you tighten it because the outer lever is threaded and that pulls the smoke box door very tight up against the smoke box itself. Here I've turned around the smoke box so you can see inside it. The locking lever is not precisely in the right position but it doesn't have to be, although retrospectively it's always a good idea to make sure that the middle lever is at 90 degrees. The chimney construction is a bit odd really. Normally a chimney on a steam locomotive is fitted with something called a petticoat pipe and this focuses the blast from the exhaust blast nozzle up the chimney but I think in this case it's just a piece of pipe. When I get a copy of the drawings next week from Blackgates Engineering I'll have a look and just check where we are with this. James is holding the smoke box upside down to show the construction of the smoke box saddle Sometimes it's a casting, but this is a very simple sheet metal fabrication. As I mentioned earlier, the smoke box does not fit on the boiler. It would if I hit it with a hammer, but I'm not going to do that. The smoke box, of course, needs to be a perfect airtight seal against the boiler, but this will not be achieved by making it too tight. I'll machine the smoke box so there's a little bit of a gap and fill it with sealant. That's if this boiler works. As with all the other parts for the moment, they're going under the table. The chimney is temporarily back in the smoke box, just so I don't lose it. Time now to look at the cab. It's a really strange contraption. It's got a brass front and very thin sheet metal sides. It does need a little bit of attention. The steel angle, which is used for bolting the cab to the foot plate, needs to go all the way along. Looking at this next part, the cab roof, you can see my logic in buying a part finished locomotive rather than having to make all these parts from scratch, which believe me, take a long time. Even something as simple as this sliding, removable roof panel. Personally, I think that these sides are a bit thin, but they'll be a lot more rigid if I reinforce them internally. In the next episode of this series, I will be dismantling the engine. The reversing lever quadrant and handle are well made, but the small piece of metal that goes down into the slots in the quadrant needs to be a bit thicker. This is not a problem. And the strange bend in the reach rod to operate the valve gear 
just doesn't seem to look right. I need to verify this with the drawing, and I'll get that next week. Whenever I work on miniature steam engines, I generally keep some of the tools and the parts for any specific job in the same box. What you're looking at at the moment on the left hand side in the blue box are the parts for the triple expansion engine. These are the parts I replaced, the brass bit is a jig that I made to set the timing and there are also some spanners in there, it makes it easier to find them. Because I will be moving parts of this project from my small workshop to the larger one, I need to put all the parts in sealable containers and these food containers are ideal. This is not going to be a short term project, I have to fit it in and around the paid work that comes in that I do. And that's it for now, stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.